Good morning. Welcome to our first of our three spatial database webinars. Yes, good morning. My name is Dale Lutz. And I'm Robin Rennie. And together we're going to be talking today about how you can make better use of PostGIS. And um, working with a PostGIS 2.0 database. Yes. So let's see. Are we on the next slide there, Robin? Who are we joined with uh, this morning? Well, this morning we've got Mark Stokes with us to do some question and answering, yep. and uh, Steve McCabe. That's right. And actually, the secret uh, helper there is Paul Nalos, who leads our database team. And I know he's got others from the database team standing by to feel the really tough questions. So all of that to say, please uh, pepper in your questions and use it. Now, we should say a couple words about introductions. Um, uh, Robin, you lead the, uh, the desktop support here at SAFE. Yes, I do. And you're a long-time database person. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my sort of speciality little niche in terms of support is the uh, the desktop case, uh, the support database cases that come through to support. And there are the odd one. The odd one does come in? There is the odd one. And <laughs> uh, as Paul will testify, we spend a lot of time finding very interesting database issues. So. Yeah, the corners of databases. Yes. And uh, for myself, Dale Lutz, I've been around at SAFE since the beginning of time, uh, since 93. And, uh, one of, and today, well, one of the co-founders, and today very much involved with trying to make FME easier to use uh, for all of the customers. So yes, there's a thing about uh, questions. Please do pepper the questions in. And uh, yeah, it's a it's a great chance to actually you know get right to the developers too. If you have something that you feel has been um, bothering you or whatever, yeah. if we don't get to your question during the webinar, we'll we'll send you a follow up email. That's so right. That so be it'll, it'll, it'll be there. So a couple words about Safe Software. We've been around since 1993. We're just about at our 20th birthday. We make the FME product, which is uh, short for Future Manipulation Engine. And we like to say that it powers the flow of spatial data from wherever it is, in whatever form it is, to wherever you need it to be, in the form you need it to be. But more generally, we would argue that we power the flow of data itself because it doesn't have to be spatial. Today, Robin's examples will primarily be involving spatial, but there's lots of folks out there that use FME with just Postgres, for example, just to do non-spatial things. The wildest example was, I think, some it was either um, like optometrist records or dental records, some form of um, special health records that were being stored in a post just, or sorry, a post just. They weren't keeping track of uh, maps with that, uh, but it was just uh, pure attribute information that uh, I know folks were using FME with. So FME sits in the middle between all these different kinds of data, CAD, GIS, that's our bread and butter. Uh, today, actually, we're going to be talking a little bit about raster. Uh, in addition to, of course, databases and non-spatial things, and even, Robin, you got some 3D for us? Yeah, I've got a bit of 3D as well. So there's a little uh, teaser for those of you that will stick it out to the end. Uh, we may do a little bit of 3D in PostGIS. And so FME converts, transforms, integrates data so that you can share it or use it in the way that is best for you. We do this primarily in this tool we call Workbench, which allows you to author your data flow from wherever the data is to where you want it to be. So in this case, we're starting with a neighborhoods table, and we're going to add some labels and end up viewing it both with the labels and, and original data. But that's the, these uh, blue things are transformers, and we add these in to give us more control of exactly what our output's going to be like. These blue transformers can be quite powerful. And today, Robin, you're going to be showing us some of the SQL based ones, I think. You're going to look at the SQL creator or executor. That's right. And some of the other transformers that are very specific for working with databases. Right. Yeah. So we're not working necessarily with very complicated workspaces. We're just looking at the transformers and pieces that relate to databases. Right. And so you'll be able to take the stuff you see today and apply it to your own workflows to solve them, I think, in more innovative and, um, and I guess, tight ways would be our goal. So we're going to go up to the polls here and ask uh, just so that Rob and I have a sense of uh, people's level of FME expertise. So let's uh, ask the question and see uh, what people think in terms of their uh, level of FME knowledge. So um, we've got a few folks that have never used FME. I can see uh, the results coming in once we get to a quorum here. 
we do appreciate those of you that are new tuning in. Uh, certainly, we hope that uh, today you'll learn some tricks that will help you. So we got, a, I think, a good enough turnout. I'm going to share those results so that uh, we all can see them. So a full 10% that have never used it. Thanks so much for tuning in. We hope you'll see some things today that pique your interest. 13% um, are experts. I think there's a, a many actually FME posted folks. That's a combo that would uh, result in, in a, a fair number of expert users uh, for sure. But uh, a solid third of you um, clocking in as novices. So so we do appreciate uh, that we will take it a little slower. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this really helps us to figure out how to uh, pitch this talk. And I'll repeat what Dale has said. Um, everything here that we're sort of doing with Postgres, we're really working on top of Postgres, and exactly the same kind of capabilities can be done in terms of using the different transformers or doing the reading and the writing. Yes. Yeah. So the two formats are quite tightly quite tied together, as any of you who are using Postgres. And a little bit of a spoiler: if someone is a SQL Server user, most of this stuff applies as well. Yes. And, yes. and in fact, if any of you watched our Teradata webinar a couple of weeks ago, you may notice um, some some similarities. similarities. And in fact, we could warn you because at the end we invite you. We mentioned that we have a couple of other webinars. This is actually the first in a series of three of a trilogy. Yes, that's right. And so today we're talking post. Just next week we'll be talking SQL Server, and the, in June we do one on Oracle. Right. But uh, yes, they will be basically the same idea, but. Focused on a particular database. With a few so. that, like today, for example, the Postgres raster is unique to Postgres. Exactly. Uh, yes. But the techniques uh, will be the same. For those of you that are new, and there are many of you in that category, we do recommend this getting started page and the weekly intro. If, if Robin and I, we got a Canadian and Australian, so we'll try not to talk too fast, but we do, uh, we will keep a fairly uh, brisk clip. Uh, if you want to get more of a basic introduction, you can tune in to the weekly, weekly intro. And that runs tomorrow at about uh, 10 a.m. It think. does, and it's an excellent opportunity to just get an overview of the product because it's yeah. actually run by a, a real person, and so that you have the opportunity to ask questions there. Yes. And so I really recommend anybody who hasn't taken a good look at desktop to to go to that right because we're going to go right in and Robin's going to start using things if you kind of want to know the story behind this you could tune in or check these resources out and I know that Stephanie and Roger will email you these slides so you'll have these links uh, shortly anyway yes. so okay now we're going to ask what kind of things that uh, kind of get under your skin when you're using databases um, that may or may not involve FME. Well, if you aren't using FME, it's not going to involve FME. So <laughs> yeah, right. What sort of frustrations do you have that you would um, that you would really like out of your life? And we'll see if they're the sort of things that FME can help you with. Right. So uh, this is a multiple choice, so people can, I guess, vote early and vote often on this one. Uh, let's see. I was a DBA, you know, briefly in, uh, in my youth. Really? Yes. Yeah, we all hate the DBA. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> they're, they're almost down there with the IT guys. You know? oh, 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 no, it was it was a good fun. I used DB2 when it was brand new, as well as Sybase. Ah, uh, so well, you that, know, FME can read both of those and write to both of those. Is that right? Absolutely, Look DB2 at that. And, and even DB2 spatial. Yeah, there, there's fun. spatial hadn't been dreamed of when I was uh, doing this. Yep. I had to make my presentations using. Uh, Transparencies, I remember. Uh -huh. I had printed charts on transparencies. So anyway, you've got a good turnout there. Let's take a look at the results. And uh, really, it's a split across almost all of them. Uh, so the DBA is still having a bad rap. And the intermediate files is interesting. That That's one thing that FME definitely gets rid of. And we know yes. actually some customers are working with, uh, before they have FME, make these massive, massive CSV files and then deal with, with that as a way of transferring and that can be avoided entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And SQL, you can avoid using SQL or SQL. Which which, which one do you prefer saying, incidentally? Um, I think it depends for how I'm using it. Okay, so, yeah, we'll, we'll yeah, go yeah, back so, and forth between both. Exactly. But with FME, if you love SQL, you can definitely work that way. And if you hate SQL, you can work that way too. That's right. And in fact, one of the examples is that we're going to be just doing exactly that. So. All right. So I think at this point, I'm going to mostly hand this over to Robin, who's going to walk us through our actual demos today and uh, following this agenda here. So uh, Robin, why don't you take it away? Sure. So this is what we're going to talk about. I've got a number of demonstrations. So we'll talk a bit about reading and writing and some of the tips and tricks involved in that. We'll take a look at uh, loading raster and 3D into our postures. Then we'll talk about the various database transformers that we have available. As uh, Dale mentioned, SQL 
executors and things like that for allowing you to issue SQL. And then what we also provide is, in case you don't want to learn that, want to be bothered with that SQL. Uh, we're also going to, at the at the end, put together a workspace which talks about uh, change detection. And in fact, in that example, we're going to be making a little bit of use of our ArcMap and ArcGIS and show you how you can get at your postgis data through Arc, ArcGIS and, and use that to do chain, um, modify that data and, and do change detection. So that's pretty much the only example where we need to create an intermediate, intermediate file between the two parts. Um, as a follow-up, you will be receiving this recording. We are recording the webinar and uh, so you'll get the recording, an email with the a link to the recording and the materials. So we wrap up all the workspaces that we build along with the um, slides and so you can make use of them yourself. Not that you can get at my post just, but you can you certainly play around with the transformers and things like that. And so. I'll also mention that uh, the, what I call the action sequences, the, the really exciting parts where Robin will be displaying 3D and so on, those will be edited out and so you can just also view just parts of these uh, the, the recording as well. We'll, we'll separate that out. Yeah, yeah. So that'll all come to you in an email afterwards. Okay, so uh, as we mentioned, I'm using FME 2013 Service Pack 1. Uh, my PostGIS is, is a PostGIS 2.0 and it's sitting on a PostgreSQL 9.2.1. Now the great thing about PostGIS and PostgreS is that the level of licensing that you need is a professional edition license, which is sort of one of our lower end licenses. And that gives you the capability of reading and writing to PostGIS and PostgreSQL. So you don't need the kind of more expensive, higher level licenses for working with these particular databases. So if you've got that level of licensing already, you can go find a PostGIS and go play with it right from scratch. Yes. So. Okay, oh, we have one more poll. So All right. Dale's not off the hook just yet. Right, I've got to pay attention here. So, so Rasta, oh, yeah. was, Rasta was new for PostGIS 2.0 and um, FME 2013. So what we really want to know is just who's using it. Is anybody interested in using Rasta? You know, you know I was on record as saying I would never do Rasta and FME, and we ended up doing it. And I'm pretty sure Paul Ramsey, one of the fathers of PostGIS, if not the father, um, once said he would never do raster in PostGIS, and he did too. So maybe we've learned to never say never. So um, let's see. Got a few 3D tire kickers. All right, I think we'll close the polls there and share those results. So we got mostly non-raster folks, but um, uh, you know, there's actually 15% that once in a while will do something with 3D. That's actually quite impressive. So uh, very interesting today, mm -hmm. and uh, four percent that are hardcore raster people. Well, that's so. yeah. So that's good. So maybe we'll just take a look at that, and perhaps you know, maybe you'll in the future put your raster into PostGIS. Who knows? Good. Okay, so reading and writing. Um, this is a database format, so we've got uh, some sort of ideas here about what you should be doing when you're writing to a database and I'm going to go through a workspace and show you each of these different um, ideas as we go through them. So we'll talk about having a unique key field and what that might be useful for. Um, with PostGIS you have the option of uh, how you handle your geometry columns, whether they're going to be ge generic geometry so that you can put lines and points and polygons into the same um, feature class or whether dogs you're and going cats, to, like dogs and cats living together. Exactly. Or if you're going to be um, very specific about the type of geometry that's going to be in your uh, PostGIS feature class. So, which is more, if, if people come from an Esri mindset, it, it's more usual that you have only points hanging out with points and so on. And that's in fact, right. I think some of the different uh, GIS clients that that are used that work with PostGIS are a little happier with you if you use um, only the specific geometries. That's right, and in fact our um, example going into ArcMap, we had to make sure that they were just actually simple polygons. Right. So post, uh, ArcGIS is quite um, rigid, I rigid guess. about what they use in terms of geometries. So we'll um, have a brief look at the different supported geometries that came in with FME 2013. Um, and then we'll talk a bit about some of the efficiencies of working with uh, databases in terms of transaction size and, and bulk copy and things like that. So I think what I'm going to do is bring up my workspace and then or bring up a workspace and we can take a look at how all this fits together. So if I open up my FME, 
my initial dialog looks like this here. So for those of you that have never seen it before, this is the uh, screen that comes up when you start up FME. And I'm just going to show you how we might be generating a workspace because some of the settings on the post just writer you have to do it at the time you add the writer into the workspace. Okay. So let's just do a simple generate workspace here. And I'm going to read some data from some AutoCAD files. So I have a, a DWG file out here. And as I type in the extension or the format that I'm interested in, it sort of starts to narrow down the list that's available to me. And I'm going to pick my DWG file. And then I'm going to go out there and find where that DWG file is associated. So I click on the file browser here and I can go and find my source data. So I have a, um, what is it, a water distribution network here that I'm going to go and look at. And with drawing files, I have the option here to do a bunch of stuff with my uh, source data. So I'm going to bring it in by attribute schema and I'm actually not going to expand my blocks. But every, all these other settings are Blocks are point features. Them. So basically you want to get the point features as points. That's right. Yes. Because I didn't really want to worry about blowing them up. Real good. So then I'm going to go and write to my postgis. So I've got postgis here. I can start typing that word in. And it, again, it narrows down my list. And you'll see I've got postgres as well. But I'm going to write to postgis. That really, the difference is that Postgres wouldn't know what to do with spatial and Postgres does. And in fact, you know, it's very easy to make a Postgres workspace because yeah. all it'll do, even though this is a drawing file, if there were any attributes associated with any of the features, then it would just write those to my Postgres. So. Right. So in my parameters, always with the database, the primary thing is to figure out how to connect to that database. So I have a parameters tab here in which I can set up my database connections. Now, I noticed that it was all filled in for you. That's sort of magical. But I suspect, and most, if you're not doing this and you're using FME with a database, I recommend that defaults button at the bottom. Robin must have saved this as her defaults at some time in the past. I did, because there's nothing worse than getting the password wrong five times when you're Especially trying to do a webinar. Especially doing the webinar. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but fill that in uh, is definitely a good, a good tip. But what I wanted to show you, which is the most important thing about this dialog for postgres, yeah. are these last two columns uh -huh. because, or, or options. Because if you don't select them now, you can't change them after the fact. Okay. So the, the top one is about whether or not I want to create generic spatial columns. And if I click that, it means that my feature classes can contain any kind of geometry. If I don't click it, then I will have to select the geometry on each of the feature classes. Right. So if you if you're working in an Esri kind of environment, you would leave that unchecked. That's right. Because you want the, the you want FME to force you into saying, well, these are lines, these are points. If you check that, then you can let everybody live together and like map info or I think GeoMedia right. might be a bit like that too. That's right. So that's but if you don't do it at the time that you add your writer. You're, you're sort of sunk, okay. so you have to do it at that time. Right. And then the other thing is the lowercase attribute names. Now, uh, PostGIS is very, very much a lowercase um, tool or product or whatever you might call it. So everything it expects everything to have lowercase. And so if you if you check that box, then you'll be in conformance with PostGIS. But many of the other formats, of course, have mixed case attribute names and table names or uppercase attributes and table names. And you can certainly put these into your PostGIS, but you run into issues when you're working with it in that everything has to be quoted to make it all work. And so if you're used to working with lowercase, then you might want to make sure that your attribute names are lowercase. Yes. And in fact, in my testing yesterday, I found this was something I needed to do again to get it to work with ArcMap. Oh. ArcMap was not happy with mixed case table names and attribute names. Right. So that's that's this case issue in databases is one that kind of plagues us because different other systems may or may not support it. So even if we do, it doesn't guarantee that the others will. That's right. So you have to use some caution around this issue. Yeah. And so we'll be looking at that in my next workspace as well. So by once I've selected the way I want this to look, I can click OK, click OK again, and it will build me a translation. So it tells me that in my drawing file, I had three different feature types, and I want to work with them all. I can click OK, and it builds me a, a translation. So now if I open these up, this is my source here, my source coming from the water meters, and going into a water meters table in my destination. And you'll notice here that the geometry, I, un, I left the generic columns box unchecked. So it's forcing me to use a particular geometry. If you scroll that up and down, 
So okay. these are all the types of geometries that we support within PostGIS. Now we should ask Paul, and he can chime in, but the one below that says PostGIS geometry, I think that lets you put anything you want in there. It probably does as well. Well, we'll ask Paul. So that would be a way, if you change your mind and you do want to put lines and points in the same one, you can make the table say PostGIS geometry, and now anything can live in there. Good. See, we all learn something when you come to Paul will verify <laughs> that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him to... Uh, message me but that's uh, I think uh, I think you're right actually. one of the customers Sean was asking that exact thing and I think that would be the answer there Sean yes so you'll notice that it by default it told me that these were going to be multi points but I don't actually want them to be multi points I might want them just to be simple points so I can change that geometry to right. whatever I know is coming through into here so that's the um, that's the full list of the supported geometries many of these are new to FME 2013 so things like compound curves and curved polygons and what have you, polyhedral surfaces, my goodness. There's so, a mouthful. Yes, exactly. So all of these things are new to 2013 and uh, available to you in the allowed geometry section there. Ah, one other customer asked, is, is geography listed in there? Do you see that anywhere? That's okay. actually, interestingly enough, and I've got an example showing how we're going to write okay. to geography, is in our formats parameters over here. So in the formats parameters, I can tell it that the spatial column ah, type is going to be it, geometry right, okay. So or that's geography. Orth really, that's orthogonal to the type. So in other words, yes. it's not, you can have lines that are either geography or geometry. Yes. And for those that don't know, this is a couple of the databases, SQL Server and PostGIS, maybe Oracle, have, um, the, have the concept of being able to tell the database, hey, this stuff is lat long, and so a whole new different kind of math applies. That's right. I think Oracle will hold stuff that's in a lat long projection, but it doesn't it doesn't right. work with it like geography. Sure, because geography. When, when you say that it's geography, then things like buffer mean different things. And, yes. you, and you don't have a rip at the rip in the space time continuum at the dateline and, exactly. and at the poles and stuff. Yes. So, so these are the things that are really high end things. That's right. And so post just is one of the probably not even well, was one of the early adapters of that. And so it has this option of uh, of using a spatial type of geography. And of course, you can then name your spatial column whatever you want. You could call it location, right. you could call it geography, whatever works in your environment. So that's um, completely independent of anything else. Right. Uh, the next option here is your SRID. So you, if you know what the SRID of your data is, so for instance, if I'm actually going to use um, geometry here and it's in a projection that I know of, I might want to put that uh, EPSG number in here, so I could put that in there, and then it will take that and add it to every one of the features as it's writing them out. Right, but I think if you leave that blank and we and we know the coordinate system, FME will do its uh, job of guessing that. That's right. So, so you don't have to fill it in, but sometimes your source data may not know what yes. what it's um, in, and so then you could uh, tell it here. Or if there's a little bit of DBA in you, you want to have full control and be explicit, yes. then uh, then you might want to put that in. But otherwise, we will do our best job of mess of mapping that. That's right. So a couple of the other interesting settings in here is: um, Are we going to? Does this table already exist? Yes. So do we want to drop it before we write a new one, or do we just want to empty it out and uh, write it back into it again? Keep so we have a, a couple of options here for working with the tables. Um, if you truncate the table, you can't recreate it with, or you can't add new at columns to it. So dropping a table allows you to rebuild it with a different structure to what it used to have. Right. Yep. So a couple more that are just post just specific is to create it with OIDs, which are um, sort of a random number, a uniquely For each. unique to each feature. So you okay. can set that up to either yes or no, depends on what you want to do. Um, creating an index is always a good idea if it's spatial data because you want to have it indexed so that you can uh, do spatial relationships against it. I thought that was a GST index from here. My eyes are failing me. Canadians, <laughs> the Canadians won't like that. In BC, it would have been an HST index, but we got rid of that's that. That's right, but no special taxes on your uh, feature types. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and then the uh, last option, of course, here is to uh, vacuum analyze your table, which is something that Post just likes you to do, or Postgres actually likes you to do in terms of cleaning up your tables. It sounds painful. <laughs> yeah, so, but it gets rid of all that blank space between the records. Right. You know what? I think one customer was asking about the user attributes tab. Do you want to just say a couple words about what goes on in there? Sure. 
Um, the last one, oh, of yes. course, is serial columns. So this is if you've got one of those columns that I think in PostGIS it's called a serial, oh. and in SQL Server it's called an identity. And auto increment things. And it auto increments. So ah. you can uh, set your pitch type up to do that sort of okay. thing. Okay. Yeah. Yep, so that's pretty much the parameters that are associated with each table in your writer. So you'll notice here in my workspace yes. I have three of them and I can set these individually for each one of these three feature right. classes. The user attributes on the other hand are the attributes that I might want to save from the information that's coming in. Now on my source data here for water meters there were no yes. attributes so there's nothing in here. So let's go and just take a look and see if we can find one that actually did have user attributes. Yeah, there we go. So here it's bought from my source, the attributes that were on my source and is taking them into my destination here. And the two that it picked up were feature ID and a particular tile. Yeah. Now, I discovered that on the source they were both bar charts. If they had been numeric, it might have picked a different data type. Yes. And in here is the list of all the available data types to me. Wow. So okay. you'll notice again, those are all PostGIS data types. Um, it's probably similar to the PostGRES list, yes. but they'll be completely different to the list you might find in Oracle or SQL Server or GML or Shape or any one of those. I like formats. that there's money. <laughs> yes, that's pretty cute, huh? Yeah. But possibly that means that's a number with the two decimal place. I doubt that it actually has a dollar symbol on it. But it does allow you to do things like time stamping, um, create UUID fields. The serial is in there too. And your serial type, that's right. So if you want to control the writing of the serial, you can use that serial bar, uh, data right. type. So this lets you basically design, if you were starting from scratch, this is where you create the table effectively. So you don't need to go and use a SQL statement to do create table outside of here. So this would be where those that hate SQL can kind of accomplish table creation without ever knowing how to spell create. That's right, exactly. And with my, with my level of SQL, sometimes I can never remember where to put the commas and the brackets and you know, the syntax is so picky. So this is a great way to create a table. And if I wanted to add additional value, well, let's go on to our next workspace before yes. I preempt myself. So are you going to so, run this thing? No, you know what? I'm not going to run okay. it because I'm going to show you. Um, well, we can. No, I'm no not that's okay. I'm, I'm teasing you. Yeah. <laughs> so because I think you've got. promised he wouldn't off-road me. And now there he goes before yeah. we've even got started. So let me open up uh, one of my workspaces where we, we're doing some interesting stuff here. This one's not interesting enough to run. Nah, we got all kinds of stuff in this next one. Okay. Okay. Zoom her up a bit. Let's zoom in here a bit. Yeah. I need to perhaps get rid of a bit more, give myself a bit more screen space. Okay, so this is basically that same example, but here where I've, what I've done is used an entity ID to be my unique field in my postures, and so here uh, I also. Um, have set my output such that it will uh, drop the table first because I was practicing this yesterday, of course, and so I've probably got tables in there. So we will run this example here and we'll just take a look at what happens when we do run it. And you'll notice that down the bottom here I have a log window which shows me what's going on. And so it wow. will tell me how many features I've read and how many features I've written and where they've come from and things like that. So here I've got water lines, water meters, and water nodes and they'll have been written into my PostGIS database. Now I also noticed that inside of your workspace after you were done, those lines were labeled with those same kind of numbers. Exactly, so it's telling me which, which feature class is writing to which feature class and how many features are going through into them. Okay, so that's sort of the very simplest of all of our examples. So I'm going to go on now and take a look at a different example where we're actually going to take some non-spatial data and convert it into that geography type that somebody was asking about. So let's go and just take a look at what this uh, source data looks like here. Let me open the containing folder of my source data, data and it's a CSV file. So this is a CSV file of some address information. Many of you work with CSV and this um, is an opportunity to show you how easy it is to get it into a database and what's more, turn it into geometry because over here in the very end of it, we've got some X and Y coordinates. And these X, Y coordinates are actually in a projected coordinate system. Oh, okay. So whoever wanted this data actually wanted it in that long so that they could perhaps look at it in Google Earth or something crazy like that. So here we've got some CSV data of address information and we're going to load it up into our um, 
into our So you're starting non-spatial here, yeah. Yes, so in this case, this reader here is a non-spatial reader. It's my CSV reader, and if you op open yep. it up, you can see all those user attributes have come in. And we can just take a look at them in here. Again, we have user attributes tab. And you can see the different data types. It's tried to bring them in correctly. So we've got a bunch of different data types with widths and precisions and stuff like that. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to fix it up a bit because we want it to look like the way we want it in our, in our, um, in our database. And you'll notice that it's not actually taking all the attributes over. We're just going to pick out the ones that we're particularly interested in. Right. So the other thing we're going to do is we've got a couple of date fields here. So we're going to do things to the date fields to okay. turn them really into date fields. Yes. Because if you look at the schema of our database table, see the last update date, they wanted it as a date field. It's a database. Date data type. Yes, it's a <laughs> data, database. The other thing we're going to do is here on our address ID, it's an integer field type, but we're also going to give it an index. Ah, okay. Because it's always a good idea to have indexes in your database. So you're making an index at the same time as you're loading here. Yes. And then we're going to also convert it into the geography uh, spatial type, even ah. though our, our um, coordinates pairs were in uh, a projected so you must be going to do system. a reprojection somewhere. I'm going to do a reprojection, and of course our SRID for that is uh, 4326, which is the standard which, SRID um, for that. Pretty much hardcore geography geeks would know that, I guess. I think so, yes. <laughs> so let's have a look at the transformers that we're using in this particular part of the uh, workspace. So we have an attribute copier to start with to get our fields lined up properly. So instead of calling it uh, street nam, we want to call it street name, etc. So we can do some attribute copying. And then the critical one is to replace each one of those features as an actual geometry, so with the 2D point replacer. So here we've got some X and Y coordinate values. So those were the attributes that were in our source, and we're going to put them into uh, geometry. The next thing we're going to do is reproject it. So we're going to reproject it from the the state plane coordinate system that we knew it was in. Little shout out to Austin, Texas, the yep. supplier of all our data. Thank you, Austin. That's your coordinate system. That's right. And you're going to the lat long or that EPSG one, which you happen to know is lat long. That's right. And so we're going to do a reprojection. Okay. And then the last thing we're going to do is lowercase everything. So we have oh. a attribute renamer here that's going to take all my attributes, change the case, put them all into lowercase. Okay. And I can click OK on that. Yeah. And then the last thing was to format those dates. And so this date formatter will allow me to work on my two date fields, yeah. take them from year, month, day, and turn them into year, month, day with time, which is the way the database kind of expects them to come in. Yes. And we so, got intended, actually. Yeah. So in fact, these ones weren't too bad, but I'm still turning them into an actual date, date type. Yeah. And of course, again, I've got a bunch of options there, and I can do all kinds of stuff in that transformer. Okay. So let's try running that one and see if it works. So this is, this is your first run of the day, I think. No, it <laughs> yeah. isn't. You no, I read the other one. That's right. And of course, again, I practiced, so I'm going to drop the table that was there before and run it again. Now let's see what happens. So you can see this is a slightly bigger table, so I've got some stuff happening here with trans transactions. So it's actually doing some transaction processing. So if you take a look here, it was working with transactions. And that's a product of my writer over here. I have the ability to tell it how many features to write per uh, transaction. Okay. Yeah. The other option with the PostGIS writer is the ability to do bulk copy inserts. So this will block up my um, incoming features into a, a bulk mode and then bulk write those uh, 1,000 at a time to my, uh, to my database. And it only performs a commit at the end of each one of those thousands features. Yeah. So if I had an error and something happened in perhaps uh, transaction number 8,000, it would roll back that last transaction and it would actually tell me which transaction to start the next run at. So I could uh, say what my starting feature was here uh, to tell it when to start the process That's again. for resuming after a fail of some kind. Yeah, so I've got the ability to do some um, rollback commit transaction processing within the, uh, the database writer. Yes. And if I don't want to use the bulk copy, and for instance, if I want to do a commit after every write and things like that, I can change these uh, values so I can actually change that features per transaction down to every individual feature, 
or to a whole lot of uh, features so that I could get the whole lot into one transaction. So it's just some uh, database -y kind of things you can do there with, uh, with the options on the PostGIS writer. Okay. Okay. So let's just do one more of these in this uh, workspace that I've got here. So Robin, you're, you're, you kind of have bookmarks in your workspace and you, I do, and you're I can jump enabling around. and disabling chunks. Yes, so that we can take a look at what's going on cool. here. So the last one that I wanted to talk about was taking some spatial data that's in MapInfo and getting that into, um, into PostGIS ready for being able to be used within ArcMap. Ah. So here I've got some city parks data, which is a bunch of uh, polygons, city park polygons, so we could take a look at those. Here's a trick. You can probably say inspect, or you're going to um, inspect them. Yep. And let's that brings up our data like. inspector, ready to go. So she says OK, and with luck. Ah, yeah, but you know what? This is a zip file. Oh, wow, you're being tricky. So this is actually new in 2013 Service Pack 1, or No, it was, it was in the release, yeah. That we have the ability now to read data right out of the zip file. So I can uh, click on this, and it will figure out that in that zip file, there's a map info file. Oh. And in the map info file, I've got some polygons. And this is a table viewer you've got down at the bottom. Yes. For database people, I think view the world as one big table. So it should be exactly. very Exactly. And so this is also new in 2013, and this is wonderful. So yes. those of you that have, are the expert users and haven't yet gone to the data inspector, this is the reason for going to it. Yeah, it's, it's the, the killer app. Yeah. And actually, I know this is off-roading, Robin, but why don't you hit the button at the top that puts the table into the top thing right beside the 3D view? Okay, right here. Because yeah, database so. people would view the world in this way. <laughs> exactly. If, and if your data is non-spatial, this is a really good way to do this. In fact, it'll start up like this. Yes. And so going back to being able to see both of them, when I click on a feature here, you'll notice it goes to that feature line in my table. Yeah. But I've still got the old window that I'm used to that from the universal viewer showing what my uh, data looks like over right. here. Right. Okay, so that's the source that I'm going to take, and I'm going to load it up into my uh, PostGIS. So one of the things I had to do here, this was rather an interesting little problem, because some of my um, polygons, if you look at them, there's, I've got one here, that's actually an aggregate of polygons. Oh, it's a multi-part. So it's a multi-part polygon. So you can see when I uh, click on it that I've got three little pieces to it. Yes. And ArcMap didn't like that. Okay. So the first thing I had to do was actually de-aggregate it. So PostGIS was happy enough. PostGIS would have been happy. But, but to view it in that client. And that's one of the issues you get into. About you know, I noticed earlier you went from multi-point to point. You basically mm -hmm. have to configure the database in a way that's happy for the client that might be using it. Because yes. the client may or may not support all the dialects or the ways of using your PostGIS. Yes. And so here I sort of had some interesting problems with this little part of it, actually, because I was going to let post just the writer itself right to those simple polygons you'll see the geometry type is a post just polygon and it actually de-aggregated them for me as it wrote them yes but the problem was that I had set my ID field uh, as a primary key yes and my uh, I was getting uh, constraint violations because I had multiple primary keys that were Got the same it. value so it, it was an interesting process here. So first I de-aggregate them myself, yeah. and then I count them. And so counting them allowed me to give them each a unique identifier that then was unique for every single polygon going into my Right, output. so you, you basically assign your own ID across all the, the simple polygons you get. Yes. And you for some reason you needed to recalculate the areas? Oh, it never had an area. It Just never had an area before, so I wanted to um, recalculate the area, so yeah. that was a simple transformer that just allows me to calculate area and put it into a, an attribute that's on my destination yeah. and then copying just to copy and clean up my particular names that I wanted to use into my database. The alternative name. Yes. It seemed a little easier to say than name alt. Right. Okay, so that was the last part of my um, last part of my workspace here, so I'll just run that bit. And then we'll go over to post just and take a look at what I've managed to fill up. Because you've never actually shown database. us that you've actually no, done anything. No, that's right. So let's go and take a look. The clever elephant there. Yep. PG admin. Pretty um, common application if you're Again, used to working. Again, a DBA would use this. It's kind of scary. Yep. So here's my post just 2.0 uh, database with or connection with my post just database. Bunch of schemas and my FME schema is the one that I've been working within and I've got a bunch of tables in here. So if we take a look. Here is my city parks table with the various columns. So there's my alternative uh -huh. name column. Yeah. And in fact, I can go and look at this 
um, with my data viewer here. And so there are my different identifiers and the names. And in fact, this table I created with OIDs. So oh, yeah, okay. I could have uh, perhaps used those. But again, um, Post just wasn't happy with them. So it was better to stick with a, a proper ID field. Um, so similarly, what else did I load in here? My address points geography type. So here, if I look at those columns and if I look at the definition of that table, you'll see that the geometry type was uh, a geography here. So there's my geography data type. Again, we've got a constraint on the primary key and we've got a, a, an index on that column. So those are the, the tables that we've loaded in at this point and then my water tables down here. Okay. So moving right along, let's go take a look at the next uh, set of workspaces that we've got. We're going to go and play with some raster data. So, so this here, is a special PostGIS only. That's right. So this is a different writer. Here we're working with PostGIS raster. So you'll notice over here on my yes. navigator pane, I now have two writers for this workspace. A PostGIS writer that's for my um, 3D data. Because 3D we handle just like we handle 2D, so it's yeah. no different. And a raster writer, which is my post just raster. Very similar, they've both got uh, setups for the, for the connection files. And in fact, in this example, I've actually yes. published the password parameter so that I only have to ent enter it once in this workspace and it works for both of my readers, so or both writers. of my writers. Now the reason the folks may wonder, why did we do a special writer for the raster? The, the issue is there's just way more and different options. Yeah. So that was, I'm sure Robin's going to get into that, but yeah, okay, wow, yeah. If so, you take a look down here, we've got just a ton of different constraints that have to do very specifically with raster. So there are, you know, you can use the defaults and reasonable things will happen, but people that um, are hardcore might want to go in and modify those things. Yeah, yeah. So we'll take a look at this. So here I have got um, a... Robin, do you want to just, uh, you can show them the slider for the zoom. Just, you see where I'm pointing up uh -huh. here? Yeah. yeah. And just give it a little bit bigger for the folks at home to see. There we go. Yeah. Good stuff. So we're starting off here with the Mr. Sid file. So that's a... Um, Let's go and just take a look at it. So it's a lizard tech compressed ortho photo. We'll take a look at it, what it looks like. Whoa. So here it is. Um, beautiful photograph of yeah. uh, an area in Austin. And so we're going to load that up into our PostGIS. Now one of the settings on our PostGIS writer had to do with the size, the maximum number of bytes per raster. Ah. And when I went to load the Mr. Sid file in, Mr. Sid's a compressed format, so yes. it blew this thing up into this huge, enormous raster. And we write rasters as blob elements. Yes. So we have a, a sort of a which I could have done to yeah. fit that entire author photo into. I decided I'd tile it up. So I used a raster tiler to break it up into three by three, three. By three so that I had smaller tiles to go into my uh, database. And this is something you could play with yourself and figure out what to do. Then I had to, once I decided to break them up, then I realized I was going to have to write them into different tables. So I was using a string oh. concatenator to build up the name of the okay. table that yep. it's going to go into. So it'll have the name of the source followed by the tile number followed by the, the row number. And then I, I count them again to give myself a primary ID field. And then on the output, I do this fancy fan out on so my you're making, table. So you're name. making several. You're making a table for each tile. Exactly. Okay. So I was going to make nine tables for my nine tiles, and then just make sure that I've actually. We'll have to ask our our uh, PostGIS experts, uh, the developers, if that's necessary to do. But are we doing? But but it is yes. an interesting thing to do. Yeah, and you know what? I'm not going to run this one because it runs. It takes a while. Right, because a huge because ECW, it's, or sorry, it's, uh, Mr. Sid. That's right, and. Um, we're sort of starting to run out of time here. So the last one that I was going to show you was a PostGIS uh, 3D example, and this doesn't take very long at all. Okay, so you're going to disable I'm that part. I'm just going to disable this guy and move down to my Post 3D. Portion. And here I have a KML file oh. of um, buildings. We might just try and inspect this one. So you're going to read the KMZ? Yes. Now. There it comes. 
Now the interesting thing with this is that um, it's they're three dimensional buildings that are actually in lat long, so our data inspector has a All little right. bit of problems with them. So in fact, I'm just going to continue on. But we could have looked at them, but they are three D buildings and they yes. look really good in Google Earth. So again, add an identifier field and then write them out. So that's all this workspace does. So let's take a look at what they look like once they go into PostGIS. Yeah, I'm real curious. Okay, so we're going to start this translation. And this one didn't, it was actually amazingly quick. Because it's actually got to do quite a lot of buildings. Having said that, of course, this could be the one <laughs> that fails miserably. <laughs> Did we ever get our buildings? Oh, yet? there so they this are. Is, this is what they looked like in KML. So they're, you know, they're buildings like this. If they were, if, if you flip them into 3D, does it look? Uh, it, it's no, the data inspector has a few problems with these ones because, because the, these are the KML ones. Right. But as soon as we get them over into our PostGIS, we'll be able to take a look at them. There it goes. So there we go. So now let's open them in PostGIS. It's not a raster, so we just open them with our regular PostGIS. And you can see I've filled in all the, the that password information. Oh, okay. Here are my buildings. So this is going to bring her back. So there was there was quite a number of them. It looked like uh... mm -hmm. there's a couple of thousand. So this is them in the 2D view. So you can, if we zoom in, you can see they're all just sort of flat right. images. But if we turn them into 3D and zoom into them, we can actually fly around them. And you oh, can wow. see that we've got uh, heights and depths to there. them. Yeah. Yeah. So, wow, okay. Yeah. okay. So that's coming so that's out of PostGIS. Coming right out of PostGIS. And it's no different to using the PostGIS on 2D data. Yeah. We just used it on 3D data. Right. So that was the way it went. Are you going to show us the raster, Robin? Yeah, sure. We could look at the raster as well. I said I was going to off-road, but I... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> of course, we need a different reader yes. because we need to use the PostGIS raster reader. But it's the same setup as the uh, other reader. And we can go and pick oh, a couple I of the see. tiles, right? So here they've come in as different tiles. Right. Uh, we'll pick this one which, as well. Which, as we've mentioned, you someone may choose not to do that, but that's what we've done here. And uh, this will now be pulling them back. Right out of our post just. Maybe I should have picked a few, a little fewer. But... Well, it'll take a moment. Oh, there's yeah, something happening. Come. Yeah. They what it's in... got to do is it's just got to resample them down into ways there they so come. can view them. So. Yeah, yeah. In any case, yeah. that they, they may or may not have been contiguous ones either. Like you just picked a few. So yeah, now if you I zoom in so. tight here, yeah. right there we go. It'll it'll and just take time. And you can see that it's actually still incredibly good quality. Right. Know? So we haven't lost a lot of uh, right quality by breaking them up and no. and uncompressing them. Remember, we had yes. to uncompress them because they were Mr. Simpson. That, that's so. the key thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's see. Where are we up to in our slideshow? Okay. So we talked about raster and three D. Oh gosh, we've got lots to go. We're just about out of time. So. All right, so I'll stop. Uh, <laughs> but but I think we've what we've done here is given a. This was a bit of an intro crowd. We've yes. given a good solid foundation. I will uh, let Robin go through and show some of these more advanced features now. Yeah. Um, in the last fifteen minutes or so that we've got. Okay, so just a reminder that these are the various database transformers that we've got. So we have SQL Executor and SQL Creator. We can do reading of features, which allows you actually to read features from a database midstream in a translation process. And the joiner does a similar thing. The joiner works with non-spatial data, but the feature reader will do the spatial. And it also allows you to do spatial interaction, like contains and intersects and things like that. Um, we were going to hope to get to a change detector, but even if we don't show these, you know, we'll still send you the workspaces so you can play with them. And then the geometry validator, which is new in 2013, is really essential tool for working with databases because you can um, take a look at the data and make sure it's valid in terms of self-intersections or whatever inconsistencies that the database will not accept, you can fix with your geometry validator or even run it against the data afterwards and see what, uh, what features have failed because some databases will let you write anything into them even if it's not particularly right. valid stuff. Okay, so let's take a look at, we'll just have a look at um, our second example. <laughs> yes, second example, and it takes a while to get going here. The SQL Creator, um, let's just see what that one was going to do. Okay, this is pretty simple. It was just going to uh, select some data from a database, so we don't actually need to run this. 
SQL Creator allows you to set up a SQL statement, and in our case, we were going to just select a particular one of those parks rather than reading in the whole lot of them. In fact, what you'd be more likely to do is use a very sophisticated join yes. transformer that was doing multiple inner and outer joins to, to pull together a bunch of tables and um, execute shoot, them here. Shoots the results sh out. Yeah. Shoots the results out. Uh, the next one, we're using the SQL Executor. Which is like the creator, except it happens for each each row that goes by. That's right. And in this case, what it's doing is using um, some rather more interesting, there's a couple of options here. This one, the source data had been presented to us as a text file showing all the SQL statements to create a table. Oh, so yeah. it had a create table and a bunch of inserts and things like that. So what this one would do is, you know, you could, let's have a look at what it just looked like. I don't want I don't want to view it that way. I need it's to do an open it containing other. folder. Yes. A nice trick, open containing folder. And we take a look at it. So what it is is a bunch of statements like this. Right. So and so people in the past haven't known how to deal with this, and one of uh, one of the other fellows in the group came up with this neat idea of using the SQL executor to read that. Execute each SQL statement. And and pass it through. Yes. So the SQL executor becomes a very simple. Um, method of reading in the text line data that's come from that source right. and making it all happen. Okay. So that was that one. Playing back SQL basically. Yeah. And then below this you have some that do spatial queries. These are... Yes. Now this one was rather more interesting and it would have been fun to do but I think we've, we've pretty okay. much run out of time. But here what we're going to do is once those tables have been created we could actually start to do some interesting buffering stuff using um, the SQL executor to actually perform the spatial relationship um, based on the geometry. Right. So for those of you that are SQL gurus, this is the way you can continue to do your SQL from within FME. Right. Via this and we just wanted to show you that in these things we have on the left hand side a list of all the functions available to you and so, Rob, so you can get an idea as what they are and you even have a link to the help. So if you click on that help link um, we, we've tried to make that easy, and that works across all the databases in FME. And that particular example is also available on our FMEpedia site. Oh, so conveniently how, enough. Yeah, how to use the native commands to do things within your SQL executor and SQL okay. creators. So again, you'll get these workspaces even though we haven't been had the time to actually show you them. So that's one way of doing it, that, that task, but a better way to do it if you aren't a SQL guru is how to do yes. it with our feature reader. And so this translation does the same thing. It was going to bring in some source data, buffer that source data, and then go out to find the features that fall within that buffer. Right. So here the feature reader transformer, again it's going out to hit our posters database and it's going to look for a table. Customers. Yes. Basically, you're saying, show me all the customers within some buffer of the stores. That's right, and these happen to be coffee shops. So then we were looking to see who lived near yes. the Tim Hortons or right. who lived near the uh, right. Delaney's. And this, of course, works with any database FME supports, and we will use the database's native spatial index to do this very. Oh, here's where you get to say the relationship you're looking for. Yes, so here you can say, I want everything that's contained by that buffer yeah. or crosses it or intersects yeah. depending on what my particular feature types were. So that's the kind of behavior that the feature reader offers you. Right, right. so again, we're kind of saying there's the, the, if you want to do SQL, you can do SQL. If you don't want to do SQL, you don't have to. FME has the SQL transformers or other transformers like the joiner and feature reader that can uh, do these things without dipping into SQL statements. That's, that's right, so that's, uh, that's how all that okay. works. Okay, so then um, possibly just as a last, in our last two minutes, I'll just show you how to bring that post just into ArcMap yes. and then we'll leave it there. We won't go through the whole change detection part of we'll, the process. We'll, we'll just describe, but, but to go ahead. So yes. we're going to, so somehow down, you're, bringing, you're bringing your post just in here? Yes, so I, this is ArcMap, those of you that aren't familiar with it, and I am allowed to make a database connection. So here I've added a database connection to gives you the variety of platforms, so I'm using Postgres, yeah. and it points to the particular machine that I'm looking for, so my BP Postgres 20, and then I'm using my user password, etc. And so then it will go and actually show me the list of databases that are available to me on that particular machine, mm -hmm. and the one I wanted to look at, of course, was Postgres. And so I built myself a connection, and on that connection you can see that uh -huh. there's actually a whole ton of tables, so there 
table filtering is a little bit different to our table filtering. Yes. So in our case, we have these uh, ones here that were the ones we've been playing with so far. And so my city parks data, which I know is ready for post for ArcMap, can come in here and it calculates the extent based on the uh, the spatial index oh, that I've cool. created for it and brings my data right in here. And I can do all the things that I would be able to do in ArcMap, such as symbolizing things and working with my data here. Right. But the one thing I'm not able to do, and this is a this is standard with any of the database connections, is that I'm not able to edit this data here. Right. That's right. an ArcGIS thing. Nothing to do with us. No. So I guess the longer form of this demo, which I'll now talk through, is that you would have copied this into, you'd export it into a file geodatabase. That's right. Then we can edit it in here. And then you can go and use FME to do change detection between the file geodatabase and the original and yes. post updates. That's right. So I could have brought in my the same thing again here. Whoops. Bring in my geodatabase that's got this stuff in it, and then I can make changes to it. So in fact, yeah. if you take a look at this here, I had it, had it set up with some changes made to some yes. of the polygons. Why don't we take a quick look at the workspace, because I think the last thing, just as we're kind of closing out, is to show people that we can do updates to an existing database. That's right. And so that must be what one of these is about. That's right. So here, once I had made my changes in ArcMap in that little geodatabase, now the cool thing in 2013 is that I can use a file geodatabase API. I don't even need an ESRI license edition of FME. I can do it with the same professional editions yes. that I've got with PostGIS. So I can read my geodatabase using the file API, read my PostGIS, which is my original features, yeah. and do a change detection to compare the two and figure out what's different between them and then update my database. So the stuff that was unchanged, we don't care about. That's the That's yellow right. port. The added ones, you're going to go around the top here and insert them. You're telling it, please insert. Yes. See this magical DB operation. And the bottom one is telling it to delete where the ID. So basically, you're going to apply the updates. That's right. And so when I apply these up updates, and we can take a look at them, and it will There's one other trick I noticed. You're using a feature holder to do all the inserts at the end. Exactly, because when I ran this the first time, as you always do when you're practicing, it wouldn't do the insert until the deletes had happened. Yes. Because, of course, again, I've got a primary key. So things you have to worry about with databases that you don't right. have to worry about so with other So, again, features. in FME, the data follows, follows along these lines. When we hit a feature holder, that means everything else is going to be done before that one lets loose. So that in this case, all the deletes would be done. And That's that right. would make you happy. Yes. So, so, all right. So, again, you'll get those workspaces and... Um, you can uh, certainly ask us questions afterwards yep. and how to get so, these things done. You know, we've been, uh, one of the reasons we are a little bit slower is that we have been going along and answering the questions as we've been going along. So I don't know in the last couple of minutes, uh, let's just see, is there anything? If someone asks, is there any limit on the number of rows? Only the limit that Post just might impose, which I don't know what that is, but people are using huge production databases in possible. Postgres and PostGIS. Massive. So yeah. There's no limit as far as we're concerned. It comes down to memory on your machine if you're doing really complex memory intensive tasks. Yes, th then perhaps. But but really, if you're flowing data through, like the examples here, there's no practical limit. Right. And on the query side, of course, we make use of the database to just query out only the parts we want. So if you have a huge, huge table, if you have a, any kind of filtering on the query, that, then that's fine. Um, many po folks asking about upper and lower case. Uh, oh, upper and lower case is so complex. If you want to use uppercase or lowercase, you'll notice in one of my earlier workspaces I had left them all the wrong case. Um, and then that means in things like the anywhere where you're going to be accessing them. So let's take a you got to quote support. stuff maybe? I've got quote stuff here. So you have to no, I, I very carefully didn't. But what you would end up with is quotes around things like this, so that it would right. Be if it was uppercase customers, uppercase customers, you'd have to do this sort of thing. And then, if you are working with uh, SDE on PostGIS, then oh. there's all kinds of case issues. Working, right? It's really better to stick with lowercase. Just go lowercase everywhere, and then. Um, everybody's blood pressure goes down. <laughs> that's right. Everybody's happier. <laughs> okay. So I think we'll head just to our last uh, couple of slides then. So. Um, oh, yes. And there's still some of the world tour happening. Right. So. And if, if you missed the world tour, ironically, uh, Dawn's in my presentation or the, the morning presentation is all about using PostGIS actually as a database behind a vehicle tracking system. 
And so those videos are online. You can click on World Tour, uh, register, or um, uh, look at the online videos. And we use some of the very techniques Robin showed today with feature readers and so on. Yeah, and it, um, all the exciting places are left. You can go to yeah. Brazil or Australia or Europe or wherever. <laughs> Come on, what's wrong with Saskatoon? <laughs> Um, there's webinars coming up, and as Robin mentioned, this is, well, arguably this is the first in a four-part trilogy because the Terra data was oh, the first that's one. That's right, so the second um, in the four-part Yes, yeah. <laughs> the second of the four-part trilogy, and the recorded ones are at that link there. And just lastly, we do offer free training. I'm going to just, uh, if anybody is interested in that, I know some of you may have to be leaving, but um, if you are interested in our free training options, and Robin, you do the occasional database training. Yeah, we've got a SQL Server um, advanced. No, we've just done a SQL Server advanced training, but we'll be doing an Oracle advanced training sometime later in the year. And then yeah. we offer an Esri one every so often too. But uh, really the techniques are, uh, probably 60% of that applies to any database. Oh, it does. It does. And so there's a very good tutorial out there on our webpage to get you started with databases, which actually covers off on pretty much all of them. Okay. So I think uh, with that, we'll... Uh, just tell everybody we'll be sending them all these slides. If there were questions we didn't quite fully answer, our crack support team will be on that and uh, <laughs> right. getting back to you. And basically, I'm here to say thanks so much for tuning in with us today. Robin, it's been a great, great job uh, you and your team do to prep these things. And I want to also tip my hat to our friends from the database team, Paul and Matt and Raven and uh, Yeah, because Ty. they've done a lot in the last release for PostGIS. Yeah. PostGIS came out of the dark ages and into the light with the <laughs> There you guys, go. Those guys did a great job. So uh, it's much easier to work with than it used to be. Right. So on that happy note, uh, goodbye from beautiful, sunny Surrey, British Columbia. <laughs>